OK, I'm going to get started because we've got quite a lot to get through and um, we just got an hour. So um, first of all, I'd just like to welcome everyone to uh, today's SIBSI Retrofit in Heritage Committees webinar. Um, and today we're going to be looking at historic buildings and particular energy performance. My name is Caroline Catini dell and I am the principal engineer and team leader at Historic England, and I'm also the joint chair of the committee. Now, those that are joining us for the first time, the Retrofit in Heritage Committee is part of the SIBSI Heritage Group, which is one of the oldest groups at SIBSI. And we formed the committee early last year with the aim of providing a knowledge sharing platform looking at the retrofit of traditional buildings. Now, we've held a series of online talks and have been joined by specialists in fields such as conservation, energy efficiency and engineering to share their knowledge and insights. And um, we've had some really good engaging discussions and I'm quite sure today will be no different with the great speakers that have kindly offered to talk. Um, just so you're aware, we are recording the webinar. Um, it's been ever so popular. We've been sold out this one, so it's important that we can share this with uh, those that couldn't join today and you can share it with your colleagues as well. So what will we be looking at today in the webinar? So we're going to look at how important it is to understand how these buildings that we look after perform um, by carrying out in situ measurements rather than relying on published values, which can be quite inaccurate. Now, we've covered this more broadly with previous talks, but we're going to have a focus on understanding air infiltration and how we can go about measuring it. We will cover some of the other building performance measurement as well um, with the speakers we have. So each of our speakers will have around 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll take questions at the end and we need to finish promptly at two o'clock. Um, so what, what you can do is just start putting your, your questions in the chat as we go along and we'll take those at the end. And if you've got a particular um, speaker that you'd like to ask a question, can I just get you to um, add their name to your questions? That's great. OK, so on to our first speaker. So first speaker today is Dr Nigel Blades from the National Trust. And Nigel is a senior national conservator in conservation science team, and he's been in that role since 2020. And more recently, June this year, Nigel was appointed interim head of collections conservation. And Nigel plays a real crucial role in preserving and protecting the organisation's historic properties and their collections. Now, today, Nigel will give an overview about the National Trust, because I know we have people um, join them that might not be familiar with the National Trust. Um, he's going to talk about their strategy for reaching net zero and in particular the importance if you're undertaking um, any retrofit of understanding the moisture characteristics of the properties and their ventilation rates. So Nigel if I could um, ask you to to start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much Caroline for that uh, introduction and uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, so I'm going to kick off just by giving a introduction to the National Trust because I know some of you may not know the organisation um, and this talk will be taking in our work in buildings looking at energy efficiency and ventilation rates and as Caroline mentioned I am currently head of collections conservation interim but my normal work is very much in building science and its application uh, to collection of uh, conservation of collections and buildings uh, in National Trust houses. Well, to say a little bit about the National Trust as an organisation, um, this is um, Nostal Priory in Yorkshire, one of the National Trust's mansion properties. And the Trust was established in 1895, as it says on the screen, for the purpose of promoting the permanent, permanent preservation for the benefit of the nation of lands and tenements, including buildings of beauty or historic interest, and as regards land for the preservation, so far as practical, of their natural aspect, uh, including animal and plant life. So that uh, purpose from 1895, in, which is written in the 1907 Act, you can see there, uh, is very much enshrined in what we do today. Uh, and since that act was uh, enabled, we've acquired many, many buildings, many, many uh, coastal sites, landscapes, all manner of elements of natural and built heritage uh, across England, Wales and Northern Ireland we look after. Um, so as far as buildings are concerned, uh, the Trust have round about over 500 historic houses, castles, monuments, gardens, parks and nature reserves in our care. 
and included in that around about 200 historic houses with collections. Uh, and our first acquisition goes back to 1896, uh, Alfriston Clergy House. And since then, we've gradually, from the 1930s onwards, really been acquiring more and more mansion properties, uh, as buildings become <clears throat> uneconomic for the original owners to manage. Uh, and gradually, we've been opening those uh, to the public, to visitors, to members and, uh, and visitors alike. Uh, so people can enjoy all manner of buildings when they visit. So there are the grand mansions that we're often well known for, but there are other buildings, workhouses, lighthouses, the Beatles' childhood homes for Paul McCartney and John Lennon. Those are all uh, managed as National Trust properties. And the photo there you can see actually is a, a composite picture of a number of the, the main properties of the Trust, which is sort of hanging in uh, our London office that uh, depicts those, uh, those properties. Um, as well as houses and buildings open to the public, though, the Trust also manage what's called a let estate. And that's several thousand tenanted buildings which may be let uh, for domestic living, they may be let uh, for commercial purposes, and there are quite a significant number of farm tenancies as well. So many farm buildings are also part of that let estate. So it's a very considerable part of our built estate uh, and significant for taking into account our energy use and our energy efficiency. Um, the people of the National Trust, we, we have in 2022 approaching 6 million members. Uh, there are about 10,000 members of staff, around about 53,000 volunteers. And pre-pandemic 2018-19, we had nearly 27 million visits. And visit numbers uh, now back in 2023 are approaching those levels again. So we are starting to see uh, a large number of visits uh, come back uh, after the pandemic, which took place uh, uh, over the last few years. So that's a little bit of background on the Trust as an organisation. Um, and we are a very environmentally minded organisation. We look after uh, the natural environment and the way we want to look after the built environment is going to be in alignment and is going to be sort of uh, sympathetic to the natural environment. So we are concerned about issues such as climate change and our response to climate change is a key part of the Trust's policy. Uh, so this document you can see on screen at the moment is a statement of the climate and environment policy of the Trust written for internal use. It just says for staff members the sorts of things which we are uh, aiming to achieve uh, in our climate and environment policy. And the key message from this is we are seeking to become a carbon net zero organisation by 2030. So we have quite a considerable ambition in this space uh, on our carbon emissions and how we're going to manage carbon emissions going forward. Uh, how will we achieve net zero? Um, well, there are a number of approaches which we are in the process of delivering or, or have already indeed delivered. So firstly, we are in the midst of a large scale shift to renewable energy for heating uh, across all of our properties. Um, we are using to some extent local electricity generation from renewable sources as well. And we also have significant energy efficiency measures for the houses. So we're seeking to reduce heat loss uh, from both mansion buildings and from let estate. Uh, we're seeking to improve our monitoring and control systems so we understand our energy use uh, and the factors which are driving it. And we've also made big changes already to LED lighting. That was really a quick win. That's been in place probably 10 or more years. Uh, and we've also recently started to move to low carbon transport and appliances. So that means moving to electric vehicles, um, electric appliances, electric estate vehicles uh, across the trust. So that's a process now in train. And a big element also of net zero is how we manage the land to reduce emissions and act as a carbon sink. So how we operate and manage uplands, wetlands is really key for this. How we manage our agricultural land, uh, which is managed in turn by our tenants, is really important for those reduction in emissions as well. Back in 2008, the Trust uh, published a report called Grow Your Own. And this had uh, some ambitions for the 2020 goal, you can see shown in the pie chart, about energy efficiency and change in energy mix. Um, so we were basically looking to go from a situation where about a quarter of our 
energy came from oil and about half from fossil electric and then the further quarter from other mostly non-renewable sources back in 2008. We're looking to move to 50% renewables by 2020. Um, and the situation we've actually arrived at, I can show you now, this is the situation as of 2021-22, um, where we've now been able to achieve around about 44% of our electricity is either renewable or grid renewable electricity, uh, as opposed to a target for 50%. Uh, with fossil fuel electric, we are now 29% as opposed to target of 27. Uh, with oil, we've done slightly better than target. So we, we still have some oil uh, energy left in use, but 10% was the target. We were actually down to 7% of overall. And you can see there are also targets there for natural gas and LPG. So we've succeeded well, I think, in moving to renewable energy. So that process is ongoing. There's still a, a very large investment program of installing renewable energy sources at properties to mop up the remaining oil boilers and to move off natural gas in particular and LPG as well in the future. So that's one element of our energy approach. Um, in the buildings themselves, we are also thinking carefully about the energy efficiency of our heating strategies. And where we have mansion properties with historic collections, it's key for those collections care that we look after them uh, with uh, providing a suitable environment for their display. So that means keeping in particular a very stable, moderate value of relative humidity, uh, which is necessary for the uh, long-term survival and condition of hygroscopic uh, collections, paintings, tapestries, books, work on paper, all manner of organic materials, furniture, all of those materials need a moderate RH, not too dry, not too uh, damp. And we're delivering that using an approach called conservation heating, which is basically heating uh, to an RH set point rather than a temperature set point. Uh, and by doing so, it's actually a more energy efficient strategy than comfort heating. And we've done degree day analysis, which shows that conservation heating will typically demand about a third to a half of the energy uh, you would take to heat a building to around about 19 degrees for comfort purposes in the UK climate. So we can keep our buildings at a lower temperature with conservation heating. And indeed, the case study building you're going to hear about a bit later on, uh, Woolsthorpe Manor, is heated to about um, 12 degrees centigrade on average through winter. With our lettuce state, uh, we comply or exceed government standards for energy efficiency. So as a landlord, we need to meet certain standards by, for compliance with uh, requirements for letting properties. So we're seeking to achieve those or exceed those where possible. And across all of our buildings, we're shifting to renewables, heat pumps, biomass and wood fuel. Um, some of those solutions are already going into the mansion. Some of the let estate is also being equipped with things like uh, air source heat pumps. And on the right hand side, you can see actually a ground source heat pump, which is at Wimpole, one of the mansion properties. Uh, on the top, you could see that image, Grey's Quarter House in Oxfordshire, which had a lot of energy efficiency measures, including uh, insulation added to the building about 10, 12 years ago. And below are some let estate cottages at Stourhead in Wiltshire. Now, in terms of where we are with energy consumption across the trust, our, uh, we did some analysis on this some years ago, and you can see plotted in this table, some very energy efficient buildings um, managed for storage and display in Denmark. Uh, so we can see buildings which have energy consumptions annually of less than 100 kilowatt hours per meter square uh, for some of those buildings. And then you can see three national trust buildings uh, Town End, Cannons Ashby and Rufford Old Hall, which are around about 100 to 150 kilowatt hours per meter squared with that conservation heating approach I, I described. Um, and that puts us in a reasonably reasonable energy efficient performance for an old building largely unimproved with single glazed windows, possibly with some insulation. Um, you can see compared with buildings which have full air conditioning systems, such as the National Archives, National Gallery, both London and the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, you can see much higher energy consumption figures if you want to have a full air conditioning system to manage your environment and keep both temperature and relative humidity in comfortable ranges. For the trust buildings, though, we, we mostly stabilize the RH and allow a much more variable temperature. So 
we are making measures to improve the energy efficiency of our buildings and across many properties we're introducing insulation we are taking some steps to reduce drafts we're using chimney balloons we're using improved ceiling around windows in much of the letter state we will also install secondary glazing and also in office areas within uh, mansion properties there may be secondary glazing where that's uh, not not visible to the uh, external to the visitor but we need to be mindful in our buildings of the moisture climate of those buildings and their characteristics that these buildings are porous structures they generally lack damp roof courses they have possibly long-term building defects which mean moisture may enter the building from a number of sources so we are prone to rising damp penetrating damp where we've got people living in buildings obviously food preparation plumbing uh, and people themselves are all other moisture sources so in most of our buildings, it's important to some extent that ventilation is available to carry away excess moisture from the indoor environment. Um, if the building is in good order, uh, generally we find the main moisture source in our buildings is the outside air carried in by ventilation. And many of our mansion properties, in fact, most probably show a very close relation between the indoor air moisture content and the outdoor air moisture content, driving that indoor uh, quantity for the moisture. Just to illustrate that for you with an example from one property in uh, Northamptonshire in England uh, called Cannons Ashby. Uh, this property, we're just looking at here at two rooms within the house, both rooms areas open to visitors. Uh, firstly, the book room and the top graph shows you uh, the distribution of air moisture indoor outdoor ratios uh, as taken from an yearly data set of hourly readings measured simultaneously inside and outside the building so for the book room which we know to be a room with a healthy environment and no particular issues um, the indoor outdoor ratio on average is about 1.0 um, and there's a distribution not quite normal but sort of uh, slightly skewed up to the higher end of around about uh, from about 0.7 up to about 1.5 or so um, that's contrasted with the kitchen at Canada's Ashby which has a skewed distribution towards a higher air moisture content inside the building with an indoor outdoor ratio of 1.2 and if you look in the picture on the right of the kitchen floor you can see evidence of salt efflorescences the white salt deposits as water is coming up through the structure of the building it's evaporating at surface and that's not uncommon in many of our buildings that there will be evaporation of moisture within the building and sources of moisture that we need to disperse so having some ventilation in order to do that is beneficial for our building environments so whatever we do with improving energy efficiency by changing ventilation rates we need to be mindful of the moisture climate in the building and what's necessary for the preservation of collections and the building fabric itself as well so the trust have taken quite an interest in ventilation rate measurement um, so we have done some work in this area for ourselves uh, we've used particularly carbon dioxide decay method and occasionally working with external consultants we've also had lower door testing done on some buildings so that becomes less and less practical depending on the size of building some of the larger mansions are very difficult or would be very difficult to test with the blower door method but with co2 decay we can use either decay after visitors have left the building so left hand example is the long gallery at blickling hall where we made some measurements using a co2 meter in place and over a series of days we were able to measure a carbon dioxide decay curve after the visitors had left the building at about 5 p.m. and the building was closed up, you got on days when you had a, a decent visiting number, you got a good decay curve shown. And we've also used uh, CO2. Uh, we've just generated CO2 from cylinder um, and we've used that in some spaces also to measure um, the decay rate by seeding the space firstly with CO2 and then using a meter to measure, measure decay over a number of hours. The sorts of data we found for our buildings uh, using that decay method I can show you here so this is a series of measurements made given in air changes per hour just to the one or two significant figures um, and you can see we've got values from around about 0.1 in some places which are quite tightly sealed particularly the Arlington Court stable coach house is tightly sealed for dehumidification and control 
of the environment. Um, other buildings range between about 0.2 up to about 0.6. So perhaps slightly lower than some people might expect. And sometimes when uh, historic buildings are simulated, uh, an average figure of one air change per hour is often taken as ventilation rate uh, for those buildings. So an area where we've still got lots to learn. So I'm going to hand on now to Luke, who is going to uh, tell us a bit more about energy efficiency and ventilation rate itself. So over to you, Luke. Thank you, Nigel. Let me just share my There we go. Hopefully you can all see that. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Luke Smith from a company called Build Test Solutions. Um, we're a yeah, UK based um, business just uh, based just outside of uh, Northampton in, in Weed and Bet. Um, actually a grade two um, star listed building in its in itself. Um, and a quick plug, we, we've, if you like some of what um, I talk about um, today, we've got a, an open day coming up on the 21st of September. So a good opportunity to not only see a, a a glorious old building, but also um, to see some of our measurement tools and techniques. Um, so yeah, we, we exist as a business, Build Test Solutions, to to develop um, a series or a suite of um, uh, yeah novel methods for for measuring in situ performance. So that's the general theme of, of my presentation today. Um, before we get into it, I just wanted to take a start with sort of taking a bit of a step back and just have a think about. Um, what we mean by by retrofit and um, and where we are today. So um, I think it's it, it's sort of pretty clear that sort of retrofit is going to be driven by or triggered by um, obviously a homeowner, um, landlords, um, social housing providers, perhaps even yeah architects, consultants um, involved in, in it sort of uh, um, advising on sort of a renovation or a, um, it's, it's sort of um, Refurbishment project, or of course investors looking to to enhance um, their portfolio of buildings and what have you. Um, and for those stakeholders, I think it's fair to say that sort of their activity in, in, in undertaking retrofit is going to be led by quite clear objectives. They're going to know what they want to do: reduce bills, improve comfort, get to a certain EPC level um, rating. And perhaps shift to a certain proportion of, of renewables, as we've just heard um, from, from Nigel or National Trust. Um, and then the status quo is that in order to sort of embark on that journey, you would have a, a professional come in and do a series of uh, visual surveys uh, and make recommendations from that. Um, and then the way in which the, the work's going to be funded is, is either through private investment and there's quite a lot of grant funding out there supporting a lot of initiatives in this space. Um, or, of course, it's going to be a distress purchase. So the boiler's packed up. I need um, a replacement heating system pronto. Um, is that going to be an air force heat pump or, or, or sort of like for like replacement? Um, but then I think the two key questions that throws up for me is, despite the visual surveys, how do we know where to start exactly, what to prioritise? And, and what specification um, should we be retrofitting to? And then probably most crucially, how do you even know that once you've embarked on that journey, you've spent tremendous amounts of money on, on the retrofit, how do you know that it, it's truly delivered in terms of those um, those targets and objectives or desired outcomes? And I think as Nigel's even started to allude to there, uh, National Trust are clearly not only using lots of um, experienced surveyors, um, traditional uh, visual inspection techniques, um, they're starting to really draw upon data and whether that's longitudinal gathering of, of um, internal um, humidity and indoor air quality conditions or point in time tests like the tracer gas testing, the air tightness testing um, that was just touched on. So I think this is the space that we're shifting into, especially when we're talking about conservation buildings is um, it's no longer enough to just visually inspect a building. We need we need accompanying data and measurements of the true in situ performance. And just yeah, very sort of high level montage here. So lots of examples of that in relation to historic buildings. Um, it is really difficult from a visual inspection to truly appreciate what's beneath the skin. So 
Um, we can look at a, 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 what we think might be just a simple solid brick um, uh, skin building, but actually there's a um, there's a makeup of a really thick um, sort of you know, rubble sort of um, walling behind that, or um, air, um, cavity um, gaps um, of, of varying sizes. And there's going to be varying moisture content across the wall, perhaps failed rainwater goods or rising damp issues. Um, lots of unknowns behind um, plaster work, lath and plaster, different mortars, lime mortars, all of this kind of stuff. Um, huge unknowns around the depth in which um, joists and, and kind of architectural um, stone detailing penetrates those walls and um, build ups. Um, instances where perhaps things look older than they actually are. So um, sort of looking at this York stone flooring here, clearly that's um, or that could well be uh, quite a modern um, flooring solution over the top of um, a well insulated um, slab. Um, but equally, it, it could be stone straight down onto to, to dry earth. Um, suspended timber floors, how big is that, that floor void? Um, the, how many air bricks are there? Sort of how well ventilated is that space? What's driving the air changes and the, the heat loss through it? Um, so yeah, you, you get the picture and you'll be encountering, uh, lots of you will be encountering this on a day to day basis and, and appreciate the nuances far better than I do. But the, the fact of the matter is, there are limits to how much we can glean from just a basic visual survey. Um, surface moisture readings are quite common in building surveying techniques. Again, that's that's going to give you some insight into you know, moisture content of the surface, but they're not really going to guide you to exactly how well that wall is performing thermally um, and the extent of thermal bridging um, and, and so forth. So this is why, again, I think sort of in situ measurement um, of the, the actual as built building is, is really, really important. Um, so admittedly not conservation buildings as such. This is an estate of 1930s um, interwar kind of semi detached properties in South London. Um, you might drive onto this housing estate and visually the semi detached properties all look um, very similar. Um, they may well all have kind of middling EPC ratings or around a C or a D um, mark. And then here what we have is um, we've measured 10 of these and, and what we've measured is what we call the heat transfer rate, so uh, the heat transfer coefficient HTC. And so this is a measurement of the, the total rate of heat loss from a building um, expressed in watts per Kelvin. Um, so it's it's not telling you specifically where the heat loss is going, but it's a really good barometer of just the overall efficacy of the building fabric. Nothing to do with occupancy rates or um, temperature set points or the weather conditions. This is a very pure measurement of the, the, the efficiency of the building fabric. And so here we've got um, the percentage deviation from what would have otherwise been predicted by the SAP, um, SAP model. And, and before we jump in and criticise SAP, I think it applies to all models. It's a case of garbage in, garbage out. If you're guessing at U values, if you're guessing at thermal bridging, um, the, the, the value of the output is, is always going to be limited. So I think irrespective of whether we're talking SAP, PHPP, dynamic simulation modelling, um, if you haven't measured some of the, the, the inputted values, then you stand to be wide of the mark, especially if we're talking about conservation buildings with really unknowns in terms of the thickness of the wall, the makeup of the walls and floors and roofs. Um, and so here we have, yeah, some of these buildings. Remember, they all visually look very similar. Um, this one's got 43% higher heat loss than what the model predicted. And then similarly on the same exact same street, this one's got 37% less um, heat loss. And that will be just down to the way that the building has aged over time, the replacement rate of sort of the, or the state of windows and, and building components. Um, even simple things like just both may or those two extremes may well visually have 300 mil in the loft. But actually, if the loft insulation hasn't been laid in a lattice style or sort of really properly stopped that convection losses, then, then that in itself, even though visually it looks like they've got the same level of insulation, the effectiveness of that insulation could be could be compromised. Um, could be squashed under the Christmas tree and decorations. Um, cavity wall insulation could be wet. 
all these different things that yeah visually are really difficult to pick up on um, but measurement really helps helps to highlight and then I think what's also quite interesting about this chart in particular admittedly it's a small sample 10 properties but on average actually SAP is there or thereabouts so as a policy tool or a portfolio kind of tool maybe it's reasonably useful but if you're thinking about specifically what upgrades to apply where to to sort of focus your investment you're going to come up with a very different solution for um, this property on the far right versus this one on the on the left um, and when, especially if you think that heat pump suitability whether to do more insulation um, yeah you name it um, and then just to really sort of hammer that message home a bit harder we've just done done this project with um, the Department for Energy um, and Security and, and, and Net Zero, DESNES, and the Energy Saving Trust. And we kind of looked at this same phenomenon on a kind of grander scale. So this is a, a plot of 500 different properties. Again, not uniquely um, conservation buildings. It's a, it's a broad spectrum of, of thermal, much more thermally efficient buildings down here at the bottom left. Um, through to more more leaky sort of um, inefficient buildings um, towards uh, the upper end of this this X Y line, um, and again the kind of X Y line through the points is broadly there thereabouts or broadly follows the trend, um, but actually the prediction is um, only right in forty two percent of the cases. So whilst the the trend line is thereabouts, so it's okay on average. The predictions aren't able to reliably predict the uniqueness of each individual building. Um, so it's only right in 42% of cases. Um, and actually of the, the proportion for which it's wrong, 72% of those that had unexpected performance had less heat loss than expected. So again, I think this um, for us really shows that we're for our, a lot of our energy modeling and, and um, predictions, we're using these rules of thumb around anticipated U values. Um, Nigel touched on the air changes there. So we assume one air change for all buildings, all older buildings. The, the reality is they're generally very conservative assumptions. They all add a little bit of, of, of um, yeah, a little bit of fat. And we, we kind of, these all compound to mean that, yeah, we're being overly conservative in, in what we're, what we're, we're predicting. And I, yeah, again, I think this is, no more so the case than in, in, in conservation buildings where you assume the worst and we think these buildings all need some goes as far as thinking we need to tear them down and start again others think we need to go hell for leather with really radical retrofit solutions when actually i think if we stop measure understand what we're dealing with um, it, uh, get a better picture of, of the uniqueness of each individual property i think you'd really come up with some quite different um, retrofit solutions um, and if the ambition is all around decarbonisation it might be that the peak heat demand of that property as measured is actually quite manageable and we can be thinking about heat pumps and renewables more so than those sort of insulation measures that could compromise the the character of a property or it might be that whilst we thought we needed 200 mil of wood fibre and you're going to have to extend the roof line to accompany that actually you could get away with a much more modest 50 mil and and then be still heat pump suitable and, and that kind of thing so i think it really does stand to change the dynamics if we if we measure and appreciate the uniqueness of, of each individual building and and the reporting on some of that work will be um out in due course so devnos are going to uh, publish that one with us very soon um, and we'll gladly share um, and so then, as I touched on at the start, build test solutions, we exist to try and make measurement more accessible and affordable to the mainstream industry. So what we're talking about in terms of um, what these in situ measurement tools might look like, we've got um, oh, certainly at build test solutions, we put a lot of emphasis on the fabric side of things. So just as lots of us preach fabric first in terms of um, the actual interventions themselves, we're preaching sort of measurement first of, of, of that building fabric. Um, so yeah, what we're talking about is measuring whole building heat loss. So those two charts I just showed you concerned measurement of the heat transfer coefficient, the HTC. Um, we're talking about measuring air tightness, so in situ measurement using either the 
pulse method that we've developed, which is a compressed air based um, system or the blower door fan and um, doorway mounted fan solution. Uh, we're talking about measuring in situ U values. So um, again, we've got technologies around sort of one that we call heat 3D, which is a, a thermography based um, method of measuring in situ U values. We've got more conventional heat flux plate based uh, measurement techniques. We're talking about specifically using a powered flow hood to measure ventilation flow rates at mechanical ventilation points. Um, we're talking about longitudinal measurement of mold, um, uh, sorry, of temperature and RH to determine kind of insights into mold and overheating risk. Um, all of which are sort of quantitative measurements. And then, of course, you can also carry out occupant surveys and, and um, thermographic surveys, which are more qualitative in their nature, but equally kind of um, instructive. And I don't think I've got time today to go into each and every one of these, but this, this is our portfolio of products that I just wanted to give you a kind of quick insight into. So we've touched on Pulse, so this is a compressed air based alternative to the blower door fan. Um, and uniquely, this is measuring the air leakage rate directly at four pascals. So it sits nicely between a blower door fan test, which is operating in the kind of 20 to, to 60 pascal pressure range. Um, and tracer gas um, decay testing, which is measuring the air leakage rate directly at the given conditions of the day. So very susceptible to wind and temperature um, effects. So yeah, pulse sits nicely between the two, measuring air leakage directly at four pascals. Um, and it's yeah, self-contained system. You can close all the doors and windows behind you and um, and, and measure the, the enclosure as a whole. Um, equally, sort of thinking about those big mansion type properties, you can measure at a room by room level, um, which is also quite an interesting um, angle for this technology as well. We've got Leak Checker as a very simple window mounted fan um, for helping do the leakage diagnostics. So if you want to specifically find where the leakage points are, um, this is a low cost fan that you can window mount and do diagnostics with. Smart HTC is our solution for measuring total heat loss rate. So um, distribute a series of temperature sensors around a building um, as long as we know the, the mean internal temperature combined with the um, total energy consumption for, for a minimum of a three week period um, we can determine this, this heat transfer coefficient from a property and heat 3D is this, this um, IR based um, U-value measurement method that I touched, touched on just now and so that's set up a, 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 an Apple device, an iPhone or an iPad on a tripod and um, pointed at a, sort of a wall and then within shot we have these um, specially developed targets um, that help calibrate the image um, and allow a time lapse to be run over a period of an hour um, and, and from which we can determine in situ U values. Hi Luke, just to let you know just one more minute and then we move on to our if that's okay. okay Sorry no, yeah. to rush you, thank no, you. No, no problem, a couple um, more slides. Conscious the title of this was to specifically touch on the pulse technique so I just put I wanted to include this slide. Um, this is some of the early insights we're getting from early deployment of the Pulse kit. So we're, we're sat at about 25,000 Pulse tests having been carried out by our customers and, and counting. Um, a large proportion of these have been carried out in existing homes. And again, as Nigel alluded to, I think actually a lot of our properties aren't quite as leaky as we think. So you can see this, um, this fairly cool uneven um, distribution of um, sort of a mean air permeability in, in well, the, the, the median overall sorry is eight uh, eight point nine um, air permeability at 50 pascals over the whole data set but you've got this nice peak here at 7.5 um, and then again a peak ap appearing at kind of 17.8 um, or so and um, so I think that's quite interesting when we look at then the profile of exist uh, new buildings by comparison and so in summary I just wanted to sort of yeah, use these slides to highlight that I think measurement is, is really important, especially um, when we were thinking about uh, older buildings and it's often overlooked or deemed um, overly complicated or expensive. Um, tools and techniques absolutely exist today that do make that measurement more accessible and affordable than ever before. You've got the age old adage, what you don't measure, you can't manage. And I don't think that's sort of any more true of, uh, of this, um, this scenario here. Um, and in this in terms, it presents, uh, presents lots of opportunities for building surveyors, servicing engineers, architects and, and consultants. Um, and so that spills over onto this final slide. Um, 
but I think for lots of you in the audience, um, I, I really do think there's, there's opportunities here for you to acquire some of this kit and offer customers better appraisal or retrofit options, um, help those EPC orientated landlords to override some of those conservative punitive assumptions, um, especially where minimum energy efficiency standards are concerned, um, help measure peak heat demand to determine heat pump readiness, validate improvements delivered so go back and measure afterwards and check that those measures have actually delivered what we um, expected them to um, work with the finance sector to check and quality ensure spend so if you're giving lending out for retrofit measures have those measures actually delivered and then there are lots of opportunities around compliance orientated measurement services so in line with the reba plan of work past 2035 part l and f and so on and i will leave it at that thank you very much that's great. Thank you, Luke. And some really interesting graphs showing, as you've said, why it's so important to measure before you're sort of putting retrofit uh, solutions, because how inaccurate they can be just using published values or assumptions. So, yeah, very well demonstrated. Thank you. Um, so our final speaker is Hua, and Hua is uh, my fellow committee member. So I'm not going to give her too much of an introduction, but Hua is an associate professor at Nottingham Trent University where she teaches construction technology and building engineering service related modules. So Hua, if you want to, um, you're already sharing your screen, I'll let you, I'll let you carry on. Thank you. Hello. Can you see my PowerPoint OK? Yep, that's fine. Well, we can see that. Right. So uh, following uh, Nigel and uh, Luke's talk, uh, I will uh, introduce uh, a project uh, we recently set up. Uh, it's still ongoing earlier stage, so I will focus on uh, how we design this research project uh, and uh, the methodology workflow. And ho hopefully uh, after we finish this whole project, uh, we can share more data analysis. Uh, the project uh, uh, mainly led by a research from UA, but she is busy for moving house today, so I just want on behalf to present this work. Uh, the first picture is one of this uh, project, uh, project uh, which is a uh, uh, of minor. Uh, it's uh, a famous Isaac Newton's home in uh, Nottinghamshire. And uh, another project, uh, which is a uh, uh, 575 uh, Woodward Road, uh, Terence, Terence House in uh, central London. So we use this uh, to pilot project, uh, try to test our um, uh, ph physical, uh, physical measurement collection data input to uh, simulation. Then uh, analysis the building performance, uh, give the best uh, optimal uh, retrofitting strategy. So that's uh, the project. Uh, the main aim of the project, uh, as uh, Luke already mentioned about the uh, very critical important things for the physical real data measurement. So we did use the post technology measure the uh, air infiltration and uh, also Nigel already put a lot of sensors in each property, uh, measure the temperature, humidity uh, of the property itself. So that's all the uh, physical data input to support uh, which Shang Yu did about the simulation. Uh, we use uh, IES uh, uh, VE software to model the building itself. Then we can, based on this, identify the optimal retrofitting design to balance the energy efficiency and the building health and the heritage provisions. So two pilot uh, project uh, we already uh, introduced. So that's uh, information here. Uh, the reason why we uh, try to use these two buildings as a first trial, because uh, Nigel helped us find the smallest building uh, across the National Trust. Uh, Look, I have other methods now use uh, several post technology, uh, te uh, several posts linked together, maybe can measure big property, but uh, for each union, we uh, we try to use a, a step is a simple way to measure the smallest building to test the technology first. Then after that, uh, after we collect the real measurement data uh, from the sensors from uh, uh, post technology, we model both building uh, based on the ISVE uh, 
uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, the whole methodology we keep emphasizing, uh, we want to use the real data, uh, physical measurement data as an input rather than predict uh, everything uh, which is not accurate. Then put into the simulation modeling, collaborate with this uh, accurate measurement data. Uh, then after that, uh, we have an a iterative approach to retest and uh, analysis uh, after the potential retrofitting uh, strategy. So the uh, test of on-site physical test, which is a key data for this project. Uh, Luca already mentioned several technology uh, uh, his company supplied. So we use Pulse and also we can use a, a smart HATC for the uh, heat loss uh, measurement and also other measurement for ventilation rate. Uh, the purpose is to compare the physical uh, real data measure with the predict uh, modeling uh, performance. For the uh, diagnostic and analysis st stage, we even can use a thermal image uh, to identify the heat loss error uh, and uh, also addition U value test uh, assess the air tightness, ventilation, heat, heat, uh, heat loss, and the modeling with the measurement input and analysis. Uh, so far, so this workflow. Uh, uh, we could uh, co uh, collaborating the simulation as a five ste uh, steps. So on-site survey, uh, gathering all of the uh, fabric data and the measurement data uh, to support the modeling. Uh, then assess and validate model against the measurement, uh, diagnose the uh, discrepancies, uh, finally collaborate the model with the measurement input. Then after that, we can basically, based on the model, play with a different scenario uh, for the specific building, give the recommendation, uh, but still keep the building uh, house and uh, improve the air tightness carefully, uh, based on like uh, uh, improve the fabric or put uh, in internal or external insulation uh, based on the property condition. Uh, for example, these two property, uh, which is uh, quite different, uh, uh, we we think the worst of men are the Newton's house ideally can use uh, internal insulation to improve the performance. But for the uh, 575 Woodsworth Road, the uh, the inside uh, decoration actually is a uh, most uh, treasure of that building, so we cannot use uh, internal uh, insulation. Uh, recommended uh, consider the uh, external uh, insulation, and after that we can on top think about uh, the double triple glazing and even uh, renewable sustainable technology to supply the energy. And then next step we can uh, consider the iterative process after the retro retrofitting. So continue measure uh, measure the building physical data put back into the simulation, uh, doing the uh, whole life monitoring of the building performance. Uh, even further, now a lot of simulation software integrate the digital twin uh, technology into the simulation. So that's give you even higher potential to do the real time uh, monitoring, monitoring the building during the operation stage, and even can combine the occupancy model into the uh, digital twin analysis. So now we can on top add uh, three more uh, steps. Uh, this file I already mentioned, after that, you recommend the retrofitting strategy. Uh, then you can simulate again for the performance after retro retrofitting, then use a collaboration model, uh, then retest uh, analysis the uh, retrofitting performance. So it's like a whole life cycle process. Uh, that's a final conclusion. Uh, heritage building retrofitting always a challenge. We need to be careful for the assessment and the planning. Uh, but the physical me uh, measurement, uh, as Luke already mentioned, demonstrate the technology, which give you the uh, real performance of the building and give you the accurate data to input into the simulation. And then simulation modeling uh, based on the big data, data-driven uh, diagnostic uh, identify the problem uh, and also recommended the optimal uh, optimal retrofitting strategy. Then uh, following that whole life cycle, we can uh, keep monitoring the building, 
entity of the process balance the building performance and uh, uh, and the energy consumption. Uh, hopefully, the digital twin or even machine learning data analysis can give us more in uh, insight uh, during next uh, following steps. And uh, this project, uh, uh, firstly, thank uh, thank you for the six uh, heritage group give a huge support of the project and give us chance to present the project. And the National Trust uh, uh, provide the case study building. BTIs provide the technology. Nordia University colleague, colleague during last 20 years support uh, uh, BTIs to collect the data for the post uh, uh, post technology. Uh, our infiltration technology and also NTU UCL uh, supplied the uh, uh, funding to support this uh, uh, pilot project. So that's uh, thank you for everybody. Thank you for yeah. that's great. Thank you and thank you to all our speakers. Um, I'm going to move on to the questions now because we've got lots of them. Um, so I think first of all, I'm going to start off. There's been lots from Nigel around um, heating of so specifically on the National Trust pro properties around heating um, do you ever rather than conservation heating do you use do you dehumidify to control the RH? Um, yes we do um, mostly we use dehumidification in the spaces that can be well sealed often storerooms rather than open showrooms but even there are a few showrooms with dehumidifiers too and uh, I mean, one of the questions is, um, are any of the buildings open in the winter? They are, and I enjoy going to them. Um, and they talk about that balance between conservation and heating, because you mentioned 12 degrees centigrade and then comfort for um, the people working there and the visitors. How do you balance that out? What, what do you do? Um, so buildings with conservation heating could well run down to 10 degrees even during dry winter spells. Um, we, we actually have a comfort boost facility, which sits on top of the pure conservation heating where we allow the RH go down to about 40 percent and that gives us maybe three or four extra degrees at times uh, so we could get up to 14, 15 but it will still be fairly cool compared with modern uh, buildings so for staff and volunteers we would provide warm clothing um, and warm refuges where you can have a cup of tea, biscuit in a, in a warm space before you're back on shift. So we, we try and manage it that way. Uh, visitors generally will come around wearing their coats. There's not usually a cloakroom to hang your coat in. So I think most of our visitors in winter probably know what to expect. Yeah, dress appropriately. Yeah. Um, and just one more, Nigel, um, to move on a question for Luke. Um, Tony is actually a committee member. He's asked a question, which standard or document do you use to work out air infiltration rates using the CO2 decay method? Um, we followed the American Society of Testing Materials. Um, so they've got a, a test method standard for determining air change uh, by tracer gas dilution. So I think that's a standard called E741. Hopefully that answers that one for you, Tony. Thank you, Nigel. Um, so a question for Luke. Um, so Mars got a question here is to avoid over or underestimating at the modeling stage, because obviously it showed in your graph some real over and underestimating. Um, which measuring tools would you recommend be embedded within the design process to reduce uncertainty? Yeah, I've just been picking through some of those trying to reply oh, to people directly. Um, and I'll try and get through as many as I can. So. Yeah, on, on that one, generally I'd, be, I'd advocate HTC, um, heat transfer coefficient has been a really good place to start. It's it's a measure of the total rate of heat loss um, from a building. It's not going to tell you exactly where that, that heat loss is going, but it's it's a really good one to calibrate or use as a means of calibrating against a model. Um, because then if it doesn't match up, you know that the driver of that um, uh, difference is either going to be um, high air leakage or um, uh, or yeah, higher sort of um, heat loss through through conductance through the building fabric elements or um, thermal bridging. So it's it gives you a starting point. How do you how do you stack up to the model in headline terms? And from there you can, can kind of adopt a bit of a triage approach of okay, let's drill down and do more investigative measure, measurements if we need to. 
And just, I know you, I, you was limited with your presentation and you're going to get across about the pulse testing. Um, someone specifically asked, and, and I'd like to think just to historic buildings, is how, um, instead of the blower door method, which people are more familiar with, pulse testing is a lot newer. Um, how useful are they in more historic buildings or traditional buildings than the blower door um, to help with retrofit? Yeah, um, I definitely wouldn't. Um, it, it, from our perspective, it's not that it's one method or the other or one replaces the other. It's it's another tool for the toolkit in terms of um, the, 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 the main technical USP is that Pulse is measuring air leakage directly at four pascals. So if you with a blower door fan exert 20 through to 60 pascals pressurization, depressurization on a building, you're pushing and pulling on that fabric in quite a different way to uh, and in a steady state way, quite different to what wind effects would be doing or to what generally a building would experience under, under kind of normal conditions. So it's the uniqueness of Pulse is that you're measuring the air leakage rate directly at four pascals. Um, and I would argue that's helpful for historic buildings in particular because A, a you're not stressing the building envelope in doing the test. Um, we're interested in, in yeah, what the, the leakage rate is under that the normal ambient conditions. And if a building is returning as being the measurement says it's very leaky, then again, that's what would trigger perhaps a more investigative approach. You might then use our leak checker or a blower door fan if you want to investigate the leaks. Or sometimes the leaks are really obvious, just a visual inspection. Oh yeah, these windows don't latch, these draft strips are failed, um, there's an open chimney. It's it kind of sometimes it's not not rocket science as to where the yeah, leaks it's quite are. Obvious. Yeah. When you get to really sort of benefit passive house levels of air tightness. I totally appreciate you looking for a needle in a haystack, these really small gaps and cracks. And um, yeah, exerting high pressures with a fan is, is probably the way to go. But it, yeah, again, it's another tool for the toolbox. It's going to be horses for courses, I, I, would, I would stress. Yeah, thank you. Um, Hoa, maybe one for you. Um, Mike's asked a question here about old buildings um, and sort of the retrofit risk with moisture control. We're always concerned about moisture and some of our previous webinars we've talked about applying um, insulation and concerns around moisture. Um, how possible do you think it is to predict with the modelling and the type of modelling you've undertaken um, these risks of um, you know possible moisture issues? Oh. So currently we haven't uh, go to that stage, uh, but uh, uh, Nigel did suggest uh, several different uh, uh, temperature uh, scenarios. So we will test uh, these different scenarios, see what's the best uh, optimal uh, performance then recommended by based on the data analysis. Yeah. Perhaps uh, Nigel can give more information about that. Um. Uh, yes, I'm just trying to think. Okay, on with moisture. Sorry, moisture content. Why are you asking? Sorry, it was around modelling and sort of the risk of um, moisture. We're always concerned about moisture when you're applying sort of retrofit measures, and whether or not with any of the modelling you've seen, um, if you can actually predict if there is going to be a risk with moisture. Um, we probably not done enough modeling to do that prediction yeah. and we, we tend to go by observation and, and measurement um, and often observation is is very straightforward you know we have a lot of basement areas where we know there'll be a lot of moisture coming into the building we get floods occasionally small water ingresses that lead to issues as well so we're, we're dealing with a, a range of moisture problems all of the time which uh, you know, we, we observe and then take action for that's great. Um, we're actually at two o'clock, so I'm very sorry. We had so many questions and I mean, if our speakers, if they're happy to answer them in the chat afterwards, um, we'll try and get some of those answers done, answers done. That would be great. Um, but I'd just like to thank all of our speakers for taking part in this. It's really kind of you to give up your time today. And we've had a really good discussion and really good presentations. I mean, just judging by the, the amount of questions that we've had. Um, so just to finish with our next webinar, so we've not got one in September, but our next webinar is scheduled for October the 19th and we're going to be a complete change of subjects, not energy performance, building performance. We're moving on to lighting um, from one of our forums that we had, members forum, it came out that people wanted to know a lot about lighting, so retrofitting, light fittings, what is suitable lighting to use in buildings um, as well and also daylight harvesting as well. So we're going to cover all those subjects on the 19th of October. So thank you everyone for joining us today and I hope you have a good rest of the afternoon.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.